Welcome into the DNVR Avalanche Podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one rated sportsbook app out there. I'm your host, Rudo, joined as always by AJ Hayfley. Not going to spend too much time talking to you in this first segment as we have an interview with Mark Barbario from Switzerland with the amazing Nicola Martinetti talking to him on the hockey team that I don't know how to pronounce. Is it Davos? Is that who he's playing for? I forget. No. Okay. You'll well, hear it. You'll hear it multiple times. That's the only one I know how to pronounce. So that's uh, that's the one that I went with. <laughs> Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and uh, jump right into that one for you. So we'll be back at the end of the first segment. Until then, just enjoy a little bit of the voice of Mark Barbario. Okay, we should be fine. So, Mark, you're here in Switzerland. You have been here for uh, some weeks, maybe some couple of months. Uh, first of all, how, how is going your, your new adventure here in Switzerland? Yeah, it's been... Uh been really great so far like um you know before coming over here i only heard good things about uh you know like the league and obviously the, the country the quality of life and, um being here for a few months now i've got to witness it firsthand and it's, yeah it's really just uh it's a beautiful place to live especially lausanne i've really uh, you know fallen in love with the city here it's uh, it's beautiful right on uh, lac leman uh you know waking up getting to see the mountains every day it's uh yeah, it's just a really nice place to uh, to live and to play hockey. And on a, um, let's say, um, on a sports level, you are now the captain of the Lausanne team. Were you surprised by by this choice of naming you captain right away when you came in the locker room? Yeah, I, w- I was surprised. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but I think, um, you know, Lausanne is it's going through... Um, you know, the hockey club's going through some changes, uh, you know, management over the last couple of years and coaching changes. And um, it wasn't something I was expecting. But uh, when uh, the coach, uh, Craig McTavish, came to, to offer me the captaincy and asked if I'd accept, I, I said, absolutely, I would. And um, just, you know, uh, as a person and as a player, I'm not going to change. I'm just going to keep, uh, you know, being myself. I've always been a guy who puts, uh, you know, the team's uh, needs and wants ahead of my own. And, I'm just going to continue in that manner. You are 30 years old. It's the first time you leave North America to to play in another league. First of all, why did you decide to to actually leave the NHL and the North American leagues in general? Uh, why was the choice to come over here uh, overseas? Well, I just think the, the you know these last few years uh, in North America didn't really go. You know as well as I would have liked on a on a personal level. Um, I was used. You know, I, I didn't get to play many games. There were some injuries, and I was used more as like um, you know a seventh, uh, eighth defenseman. Um, not really, you know, getting a lot of games or a lot of minutes. And it just felt like the timing was right for me to to to, to get a new challenge and to um, you know to, to be counted on again as a player. I mean, I've come over here to Lausanne, and um, it's been a lot of fun to you know to to be used in all situations and to, to get minutes and uh, to be an important part of a team again. And it's, you know, as a hockey player, that's, that's what you want. You know, you want, you want to be counted on. You want, you know, you show up to the rink in the morning and the guys are like, okay, we need, you know, we need Mark's best tonight. We need, uh, we need him tonight. You know, and I didn't, I didn't feel like I was, um, you know, I was being used like that in, in North America anymore. So I wanted to, uh, want to experience a, a new challenge. Didn't you think to maybe find that the feeling again in North America in another team? We saw Av- the Avalanche team have a stacked D. You said you were oh, uh, very often the the seventy, the the eighty, but maybe in another N- NHL organization with more necessities. Didn't you feel the the way to to be maybe more more involved in the game? Yeah, it's it, you know, and that's it, it's a tough. That, that's why it's a tough decision, you know, deciding to, to come over here or to, to stay in North America. But um, I, I just I, I wasn't sure if I was going to get this this type of opportunity, um, and as well as the fact that when Lausanne did make me their offer, the offer was for for three years. Whereas I feel with the the seasons that I had the last couple of years in North America, it'd be really hard to come by a contract with more than maybe a one-year term um so in, in terms of that it'd be it was tough to pass up on the security of a, of a three-year contract uh, you know as a player I've, I've had a lot of one-year and two-year deals and 
they go by pretty quick. So to, to have a three year contract really, um, you know, just just in terms of security, really really uh, helped make my decision to come over here. Mm-hmm. And why did you decide to to join the Swiss League and not the uh, sorry the National League? <laughs> Because in North America you call it Swiss League, but actually Swiss League is the second league here in Switzerland. And, yeah. Uh, why did you decide to to join the National League and not, for example, the KHL? Um, well, I mean, Lausanne was the was actually the first team that called me and and asked if I you know had any interest in coming over to to Europe and coming to Switzerland and. Um, honestly, I, I just, I've only heard good things about, you know, living in Switzerland and, and, um, you know, the league itself, how competitive it is. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had, uh, former teammates and, and friends that have come over and, and played here as imports. And again, they've only told me that they've, they've loved playing here and living here. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's the main reason I, i didn't really have any interest, to be honest, in, in going to the, the, K, the KHL or, or going to Russia. I just think, uh, especially the fact that I'm living and playing in a place that's pr- predominantly French-speaking, which really helps my transition. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's just all pluses because I, I don't speak any Russian whatsoever, so I don't know if that would have worked out too well. Yes, I understand. Uh, in Switzerland, you're let's say not struggling with play but struggling to play with uh, consistency there are teams that are put in quarantine uh, days in days out and uh, uh, now the government decided to to play without fans in the stands uh, at least you're playing but it's been a strange season here yeah yeah it's definitely um, you know it, it's, it's a tough situation not just for us but for everybody right now obviously it's um, You know, it's not a, it's not an ideal situation for anybody, but we are thankful that we're still uh, able to keep playing. You know, albeit without fans, it's uh, it's not the same. I mean, even at the start of the season, two thirds capacity was actually pretty good. We had pretty good atmospheres in a lot of the buildings, but um, obviously the teams have to listen to what the uh, what the government says. So right now we're playing without fans. It's it's strange, but again, we're, we're thankful that we can still keep playing uh, playing hockey games. You in the NHL, obviously the the season hasn't started yet. Uh, you lived in the bubble. Uh, you saw the organization that was put behind. Uh, uh, how do you see the future of the NHL? Are you you have faith that it's gonna happen again? They're gonna play and maybe with the fans. Uh, uh, it's gonna be maybe without the fans for this season. Whichever is your feeling about it. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I'm obviously I'm keeping I'm keeping tabs on what's going on over there, and um, I know the the start date has gone pushed back. Um, it, it, you know what? It's it just it's really hard to to predict because the virus is going to decide what you know what happens when when the season will start or if the season will start. So it's it's um, I think it's just for for a lot of the players there. It's it's just a waiting game, and it's tough. I know because. It, you, It's hard for your your off season training because you don't even know when when you're what you're preparing for what the actual start date will be. So it's um, yeah, it's just a tough situation. That's why I'm, I'm I'm very lucky and very thankful that you know at least over here in in, uh, in the national league in Switzerland we've, we've been able to actually start and get some games uh, going for the season. You close the chapter with the Avalanche. You know, I heard you're happy to be here, but I have to, t- to ask the question. Uh, you saw how things went in the last couple of years with the Colorado Avalanche. You saw how Sakic uh, moved himself in the off season, uh, made made a couple of trades and stuff. Uh, don't you have a bit of even a bit of regrets that to not be there because maybe to stay there in that organization would would meant to to win something in the near future. I um. I, I don't have no. I don't have any regrets. I, uh, you know, I've, I've I've tried my best over there in North America. I gave uh, you know ten years of trying to become a a regular and a and a everyday player. And um, well, you know, I, I've I loved playing for the you know well for all the organizations that I played for. But uh, you know, Colorado gave me a chance when I was you know put on waivers. They gave me a second chance to play in the league, and I'm always uh, I'll always be grateful for that. And Um, I think the team is going in an amazing direction, and I'm not going to be surprised if they're, you know, if they're going to be holding uh, the Stanley Cup over their heads in the, in the next couple of seasons. Maybe as soon as uh, 
you know, next season with the with the moves that Joe has been uh, been making. Um, but but in terms of regrets, no, I don't have any. I've you know I've I've been very fortunate to uh, you know to, to play in that league, and I'm still fortunate to continue uh, you know applying my trade as a professional hockey player, albeit now in uh, you know in a different situation and in a different country. You were claimed in the in the waivers from the Colorado Avalanche uh, in the February of 2017. Uh, you were kind of forced to leave Montreal, which is your city, to go to Denver. Uh, but I think uh, I think it was a good move for you. Uh, would you thought uh, that you would stay three years and a half in, in there uh, when the claim happened? Yeah, I mean, it's I I didn't uh, you know it's hard to predict the future, right? So when I got picked up, I was just thinking more in the immediate sense. Uh, I was just happy to to stay in the league, um, and I was just happy to get another chance to prove myself, to prove that I can play uh, in the NHL. And then from there, it just um, you know, I ended, it ended up being a good fit. Um, it was just an amazing group of, of of guys. Like every day, it was so much fun to go to the arena, and I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to keep playing there and staying there as long as I could, um, and yeah, it, uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of uh, a lot of fun. I had some nothing but great memories of uh, of being a member of uh, the Colorado Avalanche. Are there a few of those great memories that you you, you would keep for you forever? Some maybe special ones that you want to share? I mean, the one that for me that sticks out the most is what uh, was the. Um, 2017-18 season was when we had to win the last game of the year to, to get to the playoffs, and we had the last last game of the season was at the Pepsi Center against St. Louis Blues, and um, I think going into the game they were actually ahead of us in the standings, so we knew we, we had to win in regulation if we wanted to make the playoffs that year. A year where I think every single hockey journalist predicted us to finish last, I, I think. So. Um, that for us to go into that game knowing what was on the line, um, I'll never forget the the atmosphere in the in the building. Uh, it was it was absolutely electric, and for us to come away with the win it was just uh, yeah, it's it's it was one of those games and one of those moments that I I don't think I'll ever forget as, as a hockey player. It's just, that'll stick with me forever. Just the the raw emotion of that one, you know, that one win and you're in type of feeling. It was uh, it was very special. I agree. It's a good one. I saw it from here in Switzerland. I was awake and uh, I think it's a, a great memory to pick up. Uh, did you have also maybe more negative memories about uh, something that happened maybe the last couple of years when you, you weren't playing in, in half or, or something like this? I mean, uh, I've always been a pretty uh, positive guy. It's just been my outlook on, on things in general is to, to be positive, but um, for sure, you know, the last few years, and um, it wasn't easy, especially two years ago when I had so many injuries, and it just felt like one after the other, and I could have never really get going. It was, um, that was definitely a tough season, but, um, you know, I moved on from it, and, and uh, you know, last year I didn't, I didn't get to play as much, but I was just happy that I got to stay healthy, and uh, whenever the team did need me to come in, I, I thought I contributed as best I could, and, um, you know, even he's used sometimes as a forward, which I hadn't played since I was, you know, pretty young. But, um, you know, I'm just, my mentality was, was that I'll do whatever I can to help the team and help the team win. And, um, again, it was three years. It was three years of a lot of fun. And I still, uh, you know, I've made some really good friends, uh, over these past few years, friends that I'll stay in touch with for, for the rest of my life. And it's, um, you know, that's, a, that's the beauty, beautiful thing about hockey is the, you know, the relationships you make. Um, you know, within within an organization that you you carry on, uh, you know, even after hockey. Mm -hmm. In those three years and a half, uh, you saw the team. Maybe Colorado Avalanche were one of, of if not the the, mo the team that changed the most during this this kind of window of time. Uh, uh, particularly, the defense uh, around you changed a, a lot. Uh, maybe an opinion about that. Yeah, it just. Um... Like from when I first got there, I think we were kind of a an older, slower team, and then within a few years we changed to a to a much younger, uh, faster, dynamic team with high end skill. Um, I got to see the development of um, you know some guys that have become stars in the league. Like I got to see Nathan McKinnon turn into well, I, I arguably, arguably I think he's, he's the best player right now in the NHL. If, 
I mean, maybe I'm biased because I've been, uh, you know, his teammate for a few years, but um, I just think he's so dominant. Uh, I got to see the progression of a guy like Miko Rantanen, who's turned into a premier, you know, power forward. And, um, you know, a guy like Samuel Gerrard and Kale, Kale McCarr, like these guys are, it's been, it's been so much fun just to watch them improve and progress. And, um, and they're still so young, which is the most amazing thing for, for that team, for the organization, for their fan base. I think they just have so much to be excited about. Are you going to follow your, your former teammates from Switzerland? I can't say to you it's hard because they play like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., but you're going to try to, to follow them. I'll do my best. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't fall asleep too easily after games. So if, I mean, maybe there's some nights where uh, I'm having trouble sleeping. I'll be able to catch some of their games. But I know with the, with the time change, it'll be tough. But I'll be sure to, you know, follow on NHL, um, NHL.com and watch the highlights and stuff like that. I'll, be, uh, I'll definitely be keeping track of, uh, of how they're doing when, uh, when, whenever the season gets going again. That was Mark Barbario talking to Nicola Martinetti. Appreciate Nicola going out and getting all of that interview goodness. We're going to take our first period break right here and acknowledge Breckenridge Brewery, the official beer of DNVR. You can get eight different kinds on tap down at the DNVR bar or just go to the local liquor store near you. They're pretty much everywhere these days. But if you're looking for a specific type of beer from them, you can use their Breck Beer Locator online and find it near you. Of course, we also have Strava Craft Coffee, the CBD-infused coffee that has really changed lives. We can get that cold brew down at the DNVR bar as well. So we got you covered on both of those when you come on down. Or, of course, you can always order online and get 20% off when you use code DNVR20 if that's the way you want to grab it. Second period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook with Rudo and AJ talking here. So... A lot of fun nuggets in in that interview from Barb's on the Av side of things. Him, one, believes they'll probably win a Stanley Cup in the next couple of years. Two, believes Nathan McKinnon is the best player in the league. Uh, it's things we've talked about, things we probably believe ourselves, but it, it does feel like it has a little bit more impact when you get it from a guy who has played on the team and, and knows the, the inside and out of that organization. Yeah, and I don't think that it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's, particularly surprising that he feels that way but you know this this is a guy and he says you know maybe i'm biased because i've been there but this this is a guy that's watched nathan mckinnon up close for the last couple of years for him to walk away thinking that's the best player in the world high praise (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's it would be easy to say that you know I'm sure there are going to be a lot of guys who would walk away and, and say something like that about their teammate where you'd be like, okay, I mean it's easy to say they're really good <laughs> players, they're great guys, blah 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 blah. To specifically yeah. say that is the best player in the world, yeah, that's a bit different. Yeah, and I you know um, I think it's true. We've talked about this that. He's kind of in the midst of a three-year run right now that it's hard to do. Yep. The only the only guys, you know, we we just, I went through Sackick and Forsberg's careers to see, you know, did they ever have runs like what McKinnon is on? And you know, that's that's the level that he's been at lately. So, you know, for for him, it's just the yep. guys. The guy, the guy is incredible, and Barb's just appreciating. Yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a very well liked guy. I know you were a big fan of him when he was in the locker room and in the locker room with the guys as well as as the Avs seventh, eighth D, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's the on ice product on a healthy team. Barb's being gone doesn't change that much, but. That's not to say there isn't any impact with him leaving. Yeah, he was a guy, you know, every everybody needs the guys in the room that kind of remind you you're playing hockey for a living. Yeah. You know, that getting getting to be in the NHL is a privilege. That getting to come to work, you know, you get up in the morning, you go, you go to work and you're going to a hockey rink, you're you're putting on pads and you're actually going out on the ice and playing the game for a living. You know, you need the guy, and Barb's was a guy that consistently reminded everybody that 
they get to play hockey today. Yep. And you need a guy that, that kind of levels you out a little bit, you know, that guy that's very well grounded on earth in that way. And, you know, isn't, isn't getting a big head because, Oh, he's in the NHL. You know, he gets to, he gets to play in the NHL. And that was something he was always appreciative of and something you, you need a guy like him in the locker room. For sure. And, you know, it's, it's funny because when they, when the abs lose a, a playoff series and it's, and it's like, okay, well they need to go out and they need to get, they need to get a guy with experience on the third line that'll hit somebody. And I don't care what he brings offensively or whatever. And it's like, you don't, you know, okay, maybe, you know, could, could you use, could you use a guy like that? Every team thinks it needs that guy. Right. Yeah. But some of those guys in that locker room, you know, are, are guys like Barbs, you know, a guy like Belmar, a guy like Calvert, you know, they've done such a good job. The abs front office has done such a good job of finding quality character guys. And I think it was a direct response to the fractured locker rooms that they'd had in, in previous, previous years. Year. Yeah, for sure. And I just, I think that, in response to that, they've gone out and they've gotten guys who go out of their, you know, who are, who are just, they're, they're great dudes. They're, they're very well liked and they're very well respected. And they, they change the dynamic of the locker room. They, they remind you, you know, yes, you're chasing a Stanley cup, but keep in mind, you're chasing a Stanley cup. Yep. Like this, this is still special. The journey is still special. Whether or not you reach the, reach the destination, that's to be determined. And we've now had two two players who were on that team in the last five days tell us they're that their best one. avalanche <laughs> memory was game 82. Yeah. And, you know, Colin Wilson mentioned it last week that that was a special group. That was a tight-knit group. Yep. I've, I've, told, I've told a million Barb stories from that season on this podcast over time. You know, yep. that, that was a special group that loved playing together and played for each other in a way that's just rare. And, you know, these other ads, it's not to say these last couple of ads teams haven't been tight knit. They've just been wired a little differently. They've had, they've had different focuses and different goals like that, that abs team to the, that, that abs team in game 82, that wasn't that, that was their Stanley cup. Yep. You know, they, they weren't going to win the cup that year. They just weren't good enough. The world of expectations was just completely different. Yeah, they were coming on, off of a year where they had 48 points and nobody expected a damn thing from them. Yeah. I was probably one of the highest people in all of hockey media on them, and I said, I think their ceiling is like 85 points. Yep. And they went out and had a 95-point season and made the postseason. Like, they were all respect to those guys. So I'm that was a special team, and we keep hearing about it. I'm I will be curious when you know McKinnon and Landeskog get to the later stages of their yeah. careers. See what how they, they view say. that yeah. yeah, how they view that team as well. Um because you know it's it's a little different when role players. Right. Um especially like Barbs was a big part of that team. He played on that team a lot. He was on the ice for the dog pile. Yep. You know, like they're, they're, it's a little different than, you know, had they just won the Stanley Cup and he was in the bubble and he, he didn't play a single minute. Yeah. A little, little different when you're actively part of it, but they're, they're looking at, you know, where we're, we're, we're talking about what the abs lose and barbs on ice. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's replaceable. But as a, as a character guy, you know, you're talking, the guys that are going to be in contention for that the, uh, seventh roster spot, you know, we've talked to Bowen Byram. Uh, if they don't want to turn it over to Bowen Byram right away, obviously there's Connor Timmons. They got Dennis Gilbert. Jacob McDonald is still there. Kyle Burrows is a guy with really high character that they loved. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a lot of bodies in contention for that. I none mean, of them none of them are proven in right, any way. Exactly. Here's the difference there is Barbario as a seventh D was a guy with hundreds of NHL games under his belt. 
Yeah. Someone who had been around the league for a long time. He had even been a fringe NHL or in the sixth, seventh D role for a long time before he yeah. came to the avalanche. Now the Avs are talking about Dennis Gilbert with 22 games as the, the most experienced of that. Yeah. Group. Yeah. You combine all their games played. It's like 30 games. Yep. So a <laughs> lot more unproven in that regard. And it's, I think especially you get into that conversation. Barb's even mentioned, he was like, you know, I had kind of fallen into this seventh, eighth defenseman role in the NHL and decided I wanted to play for a team where I could have a bigger role. And that's why he went to Switzerland. And that's a guy who got a legitimate shot in the NHL. You have, you have these younger kids, these guys who haven't gotten their shot in the NHL yet. Uh, There's a serious question mark on what do they want out of their career? Are they comfortable never getting a real shot in the NHL and just moving into that seventh D role with minimal experience. Well, and when we, we talked about when it happened that a three year deal to go play overseas was right. not a very common thing. Super security there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think speaking of, I think Andrew Gatto just signed a five year deal in the last year or so. So yeah. like that was a dude that got secure an offer for security. And, you know, when you've bounced around a lot, how much sense does it make to say, yep. look, I'm going to, cause he wasn't, he was, he, he understood. He said it in that interview. He understood that after the last two years at 30 years old. Yep. And he the NHL. was not, he was not getting an NHL offer anywhere yep. at best. He was going to be, they were going to give, somebody was going to give him a, Hey, come be the captain of our AHL team. Yep. And you know, that might mean a call up or two where you're not going to play, but, you know, we expect you to kind of have the Mark Alt role that Alt yeah. played for the Avs the last couple of years. Yep. And and you know, for for the money that that you're gonna make, go make something similar. Live in Switzerland for a couple of years and play 25 minutes a night. Yep. He even mentioned he got to go to a French speaking area of Switzerland where he can speak his his uh, native tongue. He's from Quebec, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. So native tongue, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's a great situation for a guy like that, where you know, you know, the, being realistic about it, you would you love to keep chasing a Stanley Cup? Of course, but if you're going to be in the AHL, you're not. You're chasing a Calder Cup, and yep. look for a guy that's 30 years old. And I don't think that he cares much about a Calder Cup. And look, he gets to go continue to play hockey, be an important part of his team as he was named captain already to yeah. that team for the next three years of his career and still make good money over there. Right. He's probably making he's probably making somewhere about what he would have made as on an AHL salary. Yep. A couple hundred K or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Where those guys, you know, they they make anywhere from you know Kyle Burrow signed for 150k in the minors. Yep. Uh TJ Tynan has one of the highest salaries in the AHL at like 500 k Yep. So you're talking the, that's good. That's good guaranteed money for the next three years. Yep. You know, Hard it's not, that down. It's, it's not F you money or anything, nothing but, like that, but it's, it's good money that he's going to. And at the end of it, 33 years old, if it goes well, this, this could be a guy that's, that gets another deal. Yeah. He for could sure. be a guy who stays there. If he's still productive, he's still a good skater. He's still doing his thing. He's, he could be a guy that, that sticks over there for a few years. And just to kind of go over Barbario's career, his estimated career earnings before taxes is about six and a half million. So he's made good money yeah. over his career, but it's not the insane amount of money that primetime NHL players make where they never have to worry about money again. Sure. But if you're good with that money, it can go. It can. I mean, that's a, that's so much runway. Oh, yeah, for sure. If you're if you're smart with it and you're you're good and you get a situation uh, that that you like and you're comfortable and and you're within your means, I mean that's the guy has set himself up for a very comfortable life. Yeah, and just to to kind of reiterate why someone like him would prefer security so much. Looking at his career, uh, he had his ELC. And then signed one year deals, three years in a row, two with Tampa and then one with Montreal. And then he got a two year deal with Montreal in the middle of which he was waived. 
multiple yeah. times, actually. He didn't even get claimed the first time. But the second time, he's waived and goes to Colorado, where he eventually signs a two-year deal. And while there's a little bit of security with that abs contract, he also saw himself essentially get beat out for an everyday role on that lineup. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense for a guy whose career path has gone like that to say, this team's given me three year deal. They want to give me the captaincy and I'm going to play every single day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, a lot of things add up here. Well, and, and just be, he was being honest with himself and knowing like, at most, he he might get a, hey, come be a third pairing defenseman for like the Kings or the Red Wings or something, right? You know, maybe be a veteran. A, you get to be the classic veteran guy on a rebuilding team. Do you really want to go and lose forty five, fifty uh, times a, a a year? Play that style of hockey that it's not fun to show up to the rink every day, and- right? And you know, by game sixty, you're just like. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm getting paid for this. Yeah. You know, whereas now he's got that kind of security where he's going to have a good life. I'm kind of jealous. Same seas. Not that, not that my life isn't dope, but I, you know, I look where I was when I was 30. <sighs> I wish I had signed a three year deal. Made, to play yeah. in Switzerland. To have made six and a half million dollars by the time you were 30 would be like otherworldly, but yeah. Uh, anyway, we do need to take our second period of break here and talk about our gaming sponsor, WGT Golf. We have tournaments coming up all November long, every single weekend, where you guys can win prizes from DNVR. The submission process is going to be a little bit different. You don't even have to win the tournament. You have to play and send in your screenshot, and you'll be entered in the raffle to potentially win some DNVR merch. Be sure to keep it locked and loaded. Some more information is going to come out about that across this week. So just keep your eyes on the podcast. You'll hear about the WGT golf tournaments. Go to dnvrgolf.com to download the game and search for DNVR3 to join our third clubhouse. You have to be in the clubhouse if you want to compete. Yeah, if you want to compete, that's the word I'm looking for in these tournaments and win yourself some free stuff. Third period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook with Rudo and AJ. We're talking about Barb's AJ. Do you want to kind of put a bow on that for us, or should we just move on? Gonna have a dope life, Bo. Yep, Bode. Good job. Nice little present. Yeah. Awesome, awesome guy. Really appreciate him taking the time to sit down with Nick and um, get that interview for us. Also, shout out to Nick. Yep, doing work over in Europe first. Yeah, yeah got the. Uh, uh, he was our guy last year when we got the Miko Ranton in interview and uh, now Barb's comes right to him. Yep. Made it easy for him. Easy game. <laughs> yeah. So excited, uh, you know, excited that we can continue to use some of our, some of our European pals. Yeah. As always the European, both people doing work for us and y'all listening to the pod with your crazy hours. The few of you that tune in live. Props to you. Definitely. Uh, but we do have a little bit of NHL news as well. That being seemingly the NHL and the NHL GMs are somehow still pushing to want an 82 game season in the coming year, which, you know, barring I wake up tomorrow and they're somehow starting the season. I don't see how that's possible. I don't, if they're, if they're taking the Olympics, um, Seriously. So the talk, the talk that they might be able to get around the Olympics problem problem yeah, is that they would split the television rights of the postseason with another carrier. Would and he allow that? That's what's the NBC, it's NBC's idea. Okay. Um, the idea, the idea here being that that would be the beginning of a partnership for these two companies sure. going into the NHL's next television deal. So they have kind of stuff in place, sure. Yeah, because the NHL, the NHL obviously wants to maximize the amount of money. Yeah. An exclusive deal with NBC probably doesn't get that done. No way. <laughs> and we've seen in the last year, NBC kicked them to the curb for yeah. Kentucky Derby. Now they're going to kick the NHL to the curb again for the Olympics. And NBC's even like, 
why don't we just open this up to other bidders? Why don't right. we open this up to our competitors? Clearly not super interested in the NHL rights. <laughs> right. Like they love having them. It's like a feather in their cap, but it's not something that they're clearly valuing at the at the highest level. And like let's be honest, like the NHL's television rights just aren't as lucrative or as important as other sports. Easily the smallest of the big four. It yeah, and like just be honest about it. But, yeah. you know, I think it's going to do, I think it would do wonders to get back on ESPN for the sport. It's it, it's all time highest popularity was when it was on ESPN regularly pre-lockout. And it was a big part of their regular rotation. It, it feels like an easy match, um, right? Because ESPN is not the super mega juggernaut it used to be that, sure. that had other high quality sports entertainment on all the time. And the NHL is obviously looking for new partners in, in that regard. So like ES- ESPN is like faded a little bit, but like, let's be real here. They're like Microsoft, you yeah, know, we're, just, you know, my, my Microsoft, Microsoft's still just doing its thing and, and printing money at this point. Uh, ESPN is they're They're still king of the sports landscape. Absolutely. It's just it's just the world has changed and you know putting hockey back in front of back in front of of basic cable you know where ESPN is it's easy to find people know yep. where it is they're not dumping games on freaking USA network and what was it like MSNBC yeah the yeah games are getting played on these random interrupting NCIS marathons and yeah like. right like there's ESPN, ESPN two. There's ESPN news that they can they can kind of just dump all of their their games onto if they need. Plus, they've got a partnership with ABC, so sometimes ABC gets some of these things. And I I, I just think that the look if you're being realistic about what's best for the sport, hockey fans hate ESPN. That's fine, but if you want if you want to grow the game and you want to put it in the best position for it to be financially. You know, profitable over the next few years, which helps grow right. the game and make it exactly. better, and more teams, more teams, more money, and you know, players get paid more, and everybody's happy here. ESPN, not, ESPN has to be a player in that, and they're going to be very interested in those rights. You're not worried about current hockey fans. You're worrying about potential hockey fans when you're you're putting it on something like ESPN. You're trying to get the viewership that isn't already watching, and. There is already a bit of a partnership there with the games that they play on ESPN Plus already. So it just seems too easy to make that connection with ESPN. And and I think you brought up a good point in ESPN, if they want exclusive rights in the future, obviously not for these playoffs, but for the upcoming contract in the NHL, they're going to have to pay a massive premium for that. Otherwise, the NHL should be looking to put their product on multiple different fronts when it comes to cable networks. 100%. Uh, Not only that, but they should be open to doing like what the NFL did with uh, doing like, hey, we're going to put four games a year on Amazon. We're going to put a couple. Baseball has that deal with YouTube. Hey, we're going to have we're going to try this out where we're going to put a couple of of actual games, live games on YouTube. And we're going to advertise the crap out of it. And all of those went really well. Those experiments went really well because you're catering to a huge fan base that's just waiting. Yeah, don't hate on the Outdoor Network. I have super fond memories of that channel. So I'm, you know, for me, it's like, an ex- I don't want an exclusive deal with anybody, whether that be ESPN or not. I, I don't want an exclusive deal with any of these for the NHL. Uh, I would prefer for them to split this up you know, five different five different companies that are all with the rights. You know, this is that great because now now you do, you have no idea which of these networks the games are going to be on. You really don't know where to find it on a consistent basis. That's problematic for sure. But opening it up and trying to just get it back in front of as many people as possible, I think, is the point. Well, it also guarantees competition, right? If you're splitting up the games you're not going to see an NBC throwing it onto their USA network because then ABC is going to play right. it on their major channel and everyone's going to go, well, NBC sucks. Yeah. 
So, Great, well, and and like if they were if they didn't have exclusive rights, they wouldn't be throwing that thing on there. Yeah, they'd be throwing it on their main channel, and they'd be saying, "What's a Kentucky Derby?" Exactly. So somehow this turned into television right conversation, <laughs> but that's I mean that's the reality of them trying to chase a new TV deal right in the middle of you know where I hopefully by next summer when the TV rights expire. It won't be in the middle of anything. It, yeah, that's also the other question. the the right the, the contract technically expires when exactly is it I, July first when the when the yeah, season is sure. supposed because it's at the end of the league year. The league year is supposed to reset July first. If they're still playing or they haven't, you know, they're not back on their normal league schedule. What's what's the screwed? exact wording yeah. of that contract? You know, there needs to be an interpretation there, and yep. so. Uh, that's also a question mark for everybody involved here is when exactly does this deal end? Is it the end of the league year? If the league year moves, is it still July 1st? What's what's the conversation here? What defines the end of the league year? Is it the awarding of the Stanley Cup? Is it July 1st as the, the rollover considered by the business side of the NHL? It's so, just, it's a mess. <laughs> It is, and if you wanted to start, if they were going to try and do 82 games and they were going to try and get into, um, they were going to to try to, to do it in like an, and get back onto a regular schedule. Yep. You know, December. It, like, let's assume like best case scenario, which is the January start date for the season for them. Yeah. So that essentially gives them five months, six months if you count. Well, so why is this so ambitious? Because playoffs start the second, let's say the playoffs start second week of April. Yep. Okay. That gives you, you have 82 games to play. That gives you a hundred days to play 82 games. That gets you second week of April. 18 days off for 82 games. That's insane. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, that'd be a hundred, a hundred days to play 82 to, to play 82 games. I mean, that's more days off than a baseball team has, but baseball teams aren't colliding yeah. with each other for 60 minutes a night. Baseball teams <laughs> play six times a week yeah. on a regular basis. So yeah, that's, that's that tells you right there just the challenges that they would have if they want to push it back, which I think you would have to you would have to obviously consider. Um, and you were to go all the way through April and say you wanted to start the playoffs the May tenth. Say they work out the the split TV deal and they can go through July or whatever. Yeah, and so say they wanted to push it back, and it's it's May tenth. You're talking... You get an extra 30 days, basically. Yeah. That's... So, yeah. then you're still talking about a back-to-back every single week. Right. You're you're at 130 days, then. You have 130 days to play 82 games. So, 50 days off, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Good that, luck trying to make that schedule. Good luck trying to fit travel into that. Yeah, I mean yeah, it's it be a nightmare. It's a total. It's a total disaster. They've already gotten rid of the All Star game, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, I imagine bye weeks probably aren't the thing. So no way. To, so <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. It just you, they've already cut all that though, and you're still saying they have to play thirty back to backs if they push the season into May. To play an 82 game season. I mean, players would just be completely done by game 60. There'd be nothing. Teams would be decimated. Yeah. I just don't see how it's, it's feasible. And I don't see any reason why the NHLPA would be okay with it. Right. I mean, the, the only thing is, is that the, the more games they play, the sooner they can get back to, maximum revenues for everybody involved the less time they have on the salary cap the more you know the more that they're getting into sure. on the money side i understand but yeah even to, then though it's not like fans are going to be in the stands for at least part of the season yeah, yeah for sure especially if you're going five games a week you know that first month in january yeah look at where the world is right now 
Right. Are we? Uh, how much? How much better are we going to be two months from now? I mean, there's an argument that we won't even be any better if not there's, worse. But... I mean, there's a there's a very. <laughs> Why would anybody have any optimism that this is just going to magically turn around? There's one person that seems to think it's magically going to fix itself. Yeah. And it happens to be the person in charge of a lot of this. So, you know, I don't, I just don't, I don't know where we feel like we would have confidence that things are going to substantially improve by January 1st. Yeah. I I don't understand how there's I, I, something different has to happen and it's not happening. So I don't yet. Yeah. I don't see how an 82 game season is possible at, at this point, uh, the NHL, I really believe should be focusing their energy on getting whatever season they can out of next year. Yeah. And like, uh, be realistic about it. Yeah. You know, like if you want to, if you want to have 10,000 fans in your, in your stands and you figure out a way to do it and you sell group tickets or only this much or whatever, 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 like just, whatever you're going to figure out, they've got to start. I want to start getting some answers here in the next month. Yep. Because this flying by the seat of their pants thing is just, if, I mean, if you hit December and they're like, well, training camps are supposed to start on the 15th and we have no plan. What, what are, what are players supposed to do? Yep. You know, players don't know that they're, they're coming back and especially in all Canadian division, those guys need to get there and get into quarantine. Which isn't even confirmed yet, by the way. <laughs> right. Not a single, not a single question has been answered. I get that there's still two months. They still have a little bit of time here, but you really don't have that much time. Yeah, I, Once you get past American Thanksgiving, you need to have answers. Yep. At, at very least internally. And, and based on the things that are coming out, like this 82 game season, it doesn't seem like they have any. Right. And, and like, while, you know, today is November 2nd and we're saying, Hey, they need to start getting a move on. They have 24 days until American Thanksgiving. Yep. So, you know, you have just a little over three weeks to figure out an, a ton of stuff and whether or not that's feasible. Because if, if you, if you spend the next three weeks coming up with a plan and then you say, okay, well, we're going to start on February 1st. Great. Now you need to start over. Yep. Right. That's another month that you don't have to play hockey. And that's another, you know, what's the schedule look like? Yep. How many because, games can you reasonably play? You know, the, the 48 the forty eight game lockout season that they had started in like mid-January, early January. Yep. And that, you know, that was a crazy sprint. Yeah. It, it was a very packed season. Uh, you you start on February first. You're gonna. What are we talking about here? Because you're not even talking about 48 games. Are you talking about even just 40? You're gonna play half of the season. Yeah, it, I mean, it's gonna be tough. It, it doesn't even like you said, and that we haven't even gotten into the how do you manage travel and all of that. Right. That's that. Those are all gonna be the big questions that continue. To, to plague every aspect of this conversation. Yep. Because you don't, if you, you need fans in the stands. You need to make this make sense from a business perspective to even have the season, which is why there's been the conversation of, you know, maybe they just don't. It might just, it might just be cheaper to not do the season at all. Yep. And that would be brutal. It'd be horrific for the Avs. Yep. Arguably the cup favorites. And they cancel the season. That would yeah. be next. And level. let's be real. All of this, all, all of this is being done because the hockey gods just don't want Ovechkin to break Gretzky's record. True. <laughs> There's only uh, two truths in the NHL: Ovi can't catch Gretzky, and McKinnon can't score 100 points in a season. That's the rules. <laughs> um. Yeah, I've, straight up. Some of that stuff is just kind of the unfortunate reality of the, what the NHL is facing. I think there's still a lot of optimism that they can get something done. It's just a matter of what does it end up being. What does it look like? You know, yep. I I get what Dario is saying in that after the way that the the NHL pulled off the playoffs, you know, he's got faith that they'll they'll figure something out and it'll work. I look, they were they were able to pull that off because they were able to isolate that's not going to be the case for the regular season. And so my faith that they pull it off is it's 
not like non-existent. It's just not as high. I thought that it, pulling the playoffs, pulling off the postseason thing should be easy enough, assuming everybody was on board and fully bought in. Everybody did. So they all followed the rules and it was fine. They got through it. The couple of times the rules got broken in the NBA bubble, they handled it and it was fine. But uh, without having no bubble. without yeah. having the isolation and without having all that, you're you're relying on what seven hundred dudes to take this seriously and to make the right decision. And you're talking about a, a sprint of a season that doesn't have the ability to do things like baseball did, where if a team tests positive, all right, we'll just delay those games. Right. Hey, we'll just move those games back. You guys are going to play seven inning double headers. Right. You know, the abs, the, the, the abs aren't going to be able to get, Oh, Hey, here's, here's four days of canceled games or four games that get canceled. And we'll make those games up at the end of the season where you'll just play 40 minute games to a day. Not going to happen. So, <laughs> and so we can make it up and we'll call those, you know, those are, Oh, those two periods. Those are full games now. Yeah. What? The NHL, I, I do wonder. I, I suspect we might see forfeits if it comes to that in the NHL. But yeah, I mean, those are again all things that have to be decided, but all things that are going to be. Hopefully, we find out yeah. the next month or two. <laughs> yeah, but I guess we're going to kind of wrap up the show today on that note. Uh, appreciate everyone watching, listening, however they consume the podcast. Hope y'all enjoyed the Mark Barbario interview at the start of the show. I uh, got some other stuff coming up for you this week. We'll probably look around the league and, and see where everything is kind of sitting before AJ gets out of here to Canada, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, but hoping this week. Yep. If not, if not uh, this week, then it'll be the beginning of next week. So it'll be happening here very soon. So there you go. He's going to and, Winnipeg for a bit. And then, uh, and then I have to quarantine. So you guys won't see me for a little bit. Yep. It's the way it goes, but. We'll still be here with the DNVR Avs podcast, and he'll be back on it whenever he's all set up there in Canada. So, yeah. Finally, we have my favorite sponsor in the entire world. AJ, do you know if you have to shave your balls in quarantine? Um, So that I don't get murdered by my significant other, I would imagine that's probably part of the process. So there you go. AJ, trying to make the fiancé happy using Manscaped to use <laughs> to get his balls in correct shape. You know how it is. You can go get their Perfect Package 3.0 and get all the products you need, whether it be the trimmer, some anti-chafe deodorant, some good-smelling uh, to toner toner that's the word uh you can get breath mints a bunch of other stuff as well to take care of all of your man parts whether it be above or below the belt head on over to manscaped.com and use code dnbr20 to get 20 percent off that perfect package for you we're gonna get out of here thank you everyone for being here chatting it up with us we always appreciate be sure to give it a like on youtube if you haven't and subscribe to the channel as well until tomorrow we'll talk to you next time